My name is Tom Hoon. I chair the BFA program in Visual and Critical Studies, and it's our department which is sponsoring this evening's event. We're very happy to have Melinda Watt with us to talk about from Paisley to Kashmir. And let me tell you a little bit about Melinda. She is an associate curator at the Metropolitan Museum. And at the Met, she's responsible for European textiles, including tapestries, as well as fans. And she's supervising, she's the supervising curator for the Antonio Ratti Textile Center. And just a couple of years ago, Melinda was the co-curator of the exhibition titled Interwoven Globe, the Worldwide Textile Trade, 1550 to 1800, that was in 2013. She previously collaborated on an exhibition of the Met's English Tudor and Stuart era embroideries at the Bard Graduate Center. Uh, the exhibition catalog for that uh, was awarded the Textile Society of America's annual book award. Uh, Melinda has taught on various textile history topics at NYU, at Bard Graduate Center, and at CUNY. Will you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Melinda Watt. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Peter, for inviting me um, to come and speak. I'm excited to, um, excited to be here, really pleased to be here. Um, so as Tom mentioned, um, my responsibilities at the Metropolitan Museum of Art are for uh, Western European textiles uh, from about 1500 to 1900. Um, my role, so I'm, I am definitely coming to you this evening from that perspective. Um, my talk on the subject of Paisley's really comes from the perspective of a Westerner responsible for Western art and trying to interpret the travels of a motif um, via objects, people, and narratives that I'm familiar with. Um, but the story might sound very different coming from somebody else. Um, I think uh, Peter can probably speak to that and will speak to that in his exhibition coming up later this year. Um, Working on the exhibition uh, Interwoven Globe, the Worldwide Textile Trade from 1500 to 1900, I worked with a team of six curators and it was really um, a very eye-opening experience for me. Uh, we learned a lot, we all learned a lot about globalization, um, about points of view, and that point of view really colors everything. And we couldn't have done a global textile exhibition um, with people who only worked from, from one perspective. So I thank my colleagues, especially Amelia Peck, for putting that team together. Um, this talk will be a kind of case study about the variety of materials, mostly from the Met, that inform the way curators, um, well, particularly the way I work, very much object-based. Um, but inform the way curators can contextualize a particular work, um, a particular work of art, a particular genre, or a particular theme. This is particularly important, I think, in the decorative arts. Um, prior to the 20th century, when practical objects, what we call decorative arts, um, after 1900, they're generally called works of design, um, fashion, textiles, furniture, these things can have a very unfamiliar look to the 21st century eye and they really need further explanation uh, to foster appreciation and the admiration that we think that they deserve. So part of my challenge working with textiles uh, prior, made prior to, the to 1900 is that many of these textiles are made by anonymous artisans, um, designed by anonymous people, and uh, used by anonymous people. And we can never really fully acknowledge their roles, but that's where the role of connoisseurship really, um, really steps in. We have to know our objects very well, and we have to know other objects very well to compare them to. So it's more challenging to present works of art when we don't have an artist's name to kind of hang on an object as a starting point uh, for an audience to understand. So this is gonna be admittedly um, a very, subjective selection of Paisley coming to the West via textiles, um, the, its appreciation in Western society, and its longevity as a, um, as a motif in Western society. 
Um, honestly, this has been more challenging than I expected. Um, when Peter and I talked about my doing this, I thought, yeah, well, yeah we can talk about that, and I'll we'll use shawls as, as a starting point. Um, part of this challenge is the um, embarrassment of riches that we have at the Metropolitan Museum, um, some of a tiny bit of which you will see today. And part of it is just the vastness of this subject um, and this journey that, uh, that we're dealing with and this motif that has so many different iterations. So in terms of worldwide textile production, we think of China today as being the kind of powerhouse of churning out yards and yards and yards of fabric and selling it all over the world. But prior to um, the Industrial Revolution and really into the 19th century, so the Industrial Revolution of the eight, late 18th century and into the 19th century, um, India was really the powerhouse for making huge quantities of textiles and exporting them all over the, all over the world. Um, we think of mostly fine cottons, but also silks and wool textiles. So along with the painted and printed cotton textiles, the paisley motif, particularly that carried by the shawl or the sash, is one of the most engaging and complex stories in the history of textile design transfer. Um, its communication, appropriation, and longevity in the world of textile design history is really um, one of the most interesting stories. We talk about the domestication of exotic designs, but the shawl with the paisley motif, or the bota as it's known in India, um, has really retained its exotic associations for Westerners to the present day. So this floral-based motif, based on the stylization of a rendering of a complete flowering plant with blossoms in full flower, as well as buds and stems and roots, um, really took hold in the Mughal court um, in the early 17th century. By most accounts, the region of Kashmir, um, and what is Kash uh, Jammu and Kashmir today, which you see on the map, was a center of fine wool weaving, uh, really beginning in the 1500s. Uh, fine shawls and sashes were part of court dress royal diplomatic exchanges, and by the later 17th century, really had entered into the uh, international trade, not only with Europe, but with the, rest of, um, with the rest of Asia and with Russia. The French, British, and Russian mania for women's shawls is well documented in the 19th century, and we'll see many more of these um, objects later. But uh, the centers of European production, um, I just want to point out, are uh, Glasgow, um, outside of Glasgow, the town of Paisley, from which the English version of the name comes. Um, and by the Red Arrow, um, east of Cambridge, is the town of Norwich, which was an early wool weaving center, also a producer of many shawls in Great Britain. And then in France, um, Paris is really the center of design in the 19th century when European production gets going. And uh, Lyon, the weaving, the traditional weaving center of Lyon is where many of the finest shawls are being made, French shawls are being made. Here we have a couple of images from what is known as the Shah Jahan album at the Metropolitan Museum. These are, these are actually miniatures, so um, you're getting, uh, but they are so finely detailed that we can blow them up this big. Um, the four courtiers whose, uh, whose portraits you see are from about 1610, and then Shah Jahan, Shah Jahan himself is a picture from about the 1620s. You can see the detail of the sashes he's wearing. Um, these show, obviously, high-ranking members of the Mughal court with their very richly decorated court fashions. Um, the robe they wear is called a jama, and it's held together with a number of decorative sashes, which always look to be some of the most expensive fabrics, um, perhaps exclusive of the turban cloths but some of the most expensive fabrics that are part of their um, very elaborate and very decorative court dress. These are two Persians or Iranian sashes made in the 17th century, probably the second half of the 17th century. 
Um, they're both silk and metal thread, um, and they're closer to some of the earlier Mughal um, pieces that we see in their very elaborate silk and metal thread structure. But this really begins the story of this motif on the far, on the far side, you'll see the beginning of the paisley, um, one of these flowers that then becomes a kind of paisley motif. Um, the paisley as a characteristic motif was used to decorate the ends of sashes and the ends of shawls worn by Persian and Indian men, um, then by Russian and Polish men at court. Um, Indian men also wore similarly decorated uh, shawls in fine wool. The first shawls were brought to the West in the 17th and 18th century. Um, they might well have been sashes that were then reinterpreted. This is a um, circa 1680 illustration from the Deccan region of India. This is the house of Bijapur um, by two artists named uh, Kamal and Chand Mohammed. Um, this is an image from the court of Bijapur just before they fell to the Mughal conquerors in 1686. But you can see that their sashes, um, particularly the one in the detail in the middle, they're starting to show that individual floral motif at the end of the sash. So the, the, the paisley is coming into being in the textile realm. Um, there are certainly other realms in the decorative arts where it appears, but we're obviously just speaking about textiles today. The, um, so the rulers and the courtiers, both in Mughal India um, and in uh, Persia of the 16th and 17th century, were wearing these very elaborate um, shawls and sashes with their beautiful fabrics. You can see that, again, on the far side, a fine sheer cotton and then more opaque fabrics. They're sitting on a glorious carpet. They have hangings behind them. Um, so this is a, it's a very, it's a decorative style of rendering, but we do have objects to show that those, that kind of decoration, this profusion of decoration existed. This is uh, an Indian sash end uh, from the late 17th or early 18th century. Um, this is an example of the format that became familiar to Europeans. So you have the pale creamy white background and the bota or the paisley motif decorating the ends. These fragmentary early shawls and sashes are still considered worth preserving and the Islamic art department at the Met has three of these shawl ends that they have collected and preserved in the collection. Um, you know, we can't imagine picking up a 19th century European shawl, a fragmentary shawl, and, and keeping it. But these early pieces are so fine, so delicate, so beautifully woven that um, they are worth preserving as a really high point um, in the art of very fine <coughs> wool weaving. These are all woven by hand in what's called a twill tapestry technique. And I realize now that I should have brought along a diagram of that, but I didn't. Suffice it to say that this is a very laborious uh, hand weaving process in which the weaver, um, mostly men, so the weaver himself has a lot of control over the final. It's not a programmed pattern, so the weaver himself has a lot of control over the final look of the, of the motif itself. Now, the paisley didn't only happen, and sashes weren't only made um, in fine wool or in silken wool. This is actually a very fine cotton, um, and this sash is about nine or 10 feet long. It's then embroidered, again, with this early iteration of this floral design that then becomes the more complicated um, paisley motif. Um, the, this, the uh, sash itself has the look of uh, the kind of um, uh, the, uh, the cloth that, uh, that uh, Jesus was, uh, the famous cloth that Jesus was wrapped in with, it's all sort of stained, but it's such a, um, such a fantastic early example of these cotton cloths and such a fine example of the, um, of the weaving. These are two so-called Polish sashes from the 18th century. Um, and again, we see this long sash. These were used as part of Polish military uniform. 
So, and these sashes are nine or 10 feet long. This is actually the front and back of the same sash. So they were made in a way that they could be folded over in half, and you have four different options by folding it in half, wrapping it around, and, and tying it. But very closely tied to the Persian and Indian sashes um, that inspired this work. These were so popular, and there was such a demand amongst um, Polish and Russian nobility that not only were workshops set up for silk weaving in Poland and in um, Russia, they were also set up in Lyon to um, purely for an export market to meet the needs of the Polish court. Now you may be more familiar with the story of Indian cotton exports to, uh, to the West. Um, this is already, by 1780, a British manufacturer um, by the name of Peel, who is copying uh, Indian-style printed cottons with these very fine little floral and paisley-like motifs. This is a sample book from uh, one, of their, um, one of their years of production, as I said, about 1780. Um, they had other Eastern-inspired inspired textile patterns, but this, uh, the little paisley motif um, that you see was a perennially popular one. Um, this is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in textiles, and it's highly competitive. The British, French, and Swiss manufacturers are competing for the European market, but they're also starting to compete for international markets. The British take over the international cotton market at a certain point, so much so that the Indian producers who have been, who were really on the top of the world for centuries in terms of colorful cottons, were actually suppressed by the British market, first by the East India Company and then by the British Raj. Um, and we'll come to a point later in the story where um, that there are people who are trying to redress that situation. But it's this trade balance is fascinating over the years. The, uh, there's an inscription on the inside cover of this, which I'll, I'll read to you. Um, again, the, the name is, the family name is Peel. So Mr. Peel has been called his high mightiness King Cotton, potentate of printing, prince of patchwork, marquis of muslin, lord of lawn, baron Barege Balzan, and count of calico and cambric. Um, so anyone who was very good and very successful in the cotton printing market had a pretty high opinion um, of themselves. We have two portraits here. Um, we have a Mrs. Horton, a slightly mysterious young woman who was, who was portrayed by Sir Joshua Reynolds in about uh, 1770. The shawl that she's wearing, um, and she's wearing a paisley shawl, a fine, um, almost certainly a fine wool shawl, she's wearing it in such a way to suggest a kind of exotic Turkish dress. Uh, in the late 18th century, dressing up, having your portrait painting, painted, going to masquerade <coughs> balls was a very popular activity amongst um, high society in London um, and in Great Britain. So here she has used her shawl as a kind of combination turban and uh, neck and shoulder wrap. Um, I wonder if she just went to Reynolds' studio, had a shawl, or he had a shawl, and she decided, I'd like to have a kind of Ottoman Turkish portrait. Because the association at this point with the turban and the pearls is not specifically with India, with Kashmir, with those exports. Um, the association with the turban is with Turkey. Um, and I'll remind you, and this is just a fact, that Westerners were really very good at conflating exoticism. So um, <coughs> Turkish, Persian, Chinese, Japanese, um, all of these types of styles, the textiles, the decorative arts were enjoyed, were greatly appreciated, but often it was the average consumer, even a very wealthy person like um, Mrs. Horton who can afford to have her painting done by Sir Joshua Reynolds. 
is not really going to understand the origin of the objects that she's wearing. Part of this confusion comes from the fact that the British East India Company, which is founded in 1600 and really has a monopoly in the 18th century on everything coming out of Kashmir and also has a pretty firm grip on the Indian subcontinent at this point, um, they are, everything's coming from India because it's the British East India Company. So things that are coming from Japan, coming from China, they're not necessarily going to understand where these objects are coming from. Obviously the different styles are understood, but things do get conflated in a way that we find horrifying now, but um, that's, that's the way it was. Um, next to her is an uh, 1810 portrait by a French artist uh, called uh, Horace Vernet. He is painting an Egyptian. This is called a portrait of a Mamluk, which is a certain, um, a certain culture within the Egyptian culture. Uh, he's wearing a turban very much like Mrs. Horton's turban. So these cashmere shawls, turbans, shawl cloths are being exported really all over the world. Um, we have to remember at this point that Egypt is part of the Ottoman Empire. So this kind of image and this kind of interpretation, again, is something that might feed what people like Mrs. Horton knew about Kashmir, knew about the Ottoman Empire. They don't know, they don't know a lot about the specifics. Um, this is also painted by Vernet at a point when Napoleon I has recently come back from his Egyptian campaign and along with uh, being the conquering hero, he brought back a huge number of shawls that had made their way into Egypt at this point, Kashmir shawls, which he brought back for his empress, Josephine, who is commonly credited with starting the craze for shawls in Europe. We know that they were appearing in Europe earlier, but this is, this is generally the story. Josephine had something like 45 shawls um, in an inventory toward the end of her life, and they were extremely valuable. She had them cut up and made into dresses, um, which is an unusual practice at that point, but we'll see later on that it's not so unusual. Um, but uh, again, um, you can see how these ideas, this sort of exoticism, romanticism, is really played up in portraiture. And both of these, both of these works are in the Metz collection. Here we have the classic Empire um, female wearing or owning, not wearing it, but owning um, a cashmere shawl. This is Madame Talleyrand by Francois Gerard. Um, this picture is about 1805. Like Empress Josephine, um, she owns a luxurious shawl, at least one, and you can see that by the way it's draped like a prop, it does bring attention to the possession itself, along with the carpet and the very uh, expensive and beautifully decorated Empire furniture. Um, we know that this formula of depicting a woman with a shawl draped on a piece of furniture so it almost has a kind of life of its own was repeated several times by um, the artist Gerard. He did the same thing for Josephine Bonaparte, Bonaparte and also for uh, Juliette Recamier. So this is the classic cashmere shawl that Madame Talleyrand owns. Uh, it's the creamy white background with the multicolored paisley or bota at the ends. And from here, the variations start to uh, manifest themselves almost endlessly. These are two uh, 1811 fashion plates from a journal called the Le Bon Genre. Um, the first variation that you see in the paisley shawl is that it has a colored ground at this point. Um, the fashion plates in Le Bon Genre from the early uh, 1800s to, uh, I believe, 1834, they're in publication. Most of the women are wearing some sort of shawl accessory, but the ones, the plates that talk about accessories are the ones that have these sort of enveloping shawls um, where the accessory is really the focus 
of the fashion plate itself. This is one of my favorite fashion plates. This is, again, Le Bon Genre um, from 1817, and the title translates to luxury and poverty. The caption really emphasizes the makeshift nature of this young woman's life. Um, she's filled it with expensive accessories and expensive fashions, but she doesn't have any proper furniture. Her bed table is made of two hat boxes. Um, she has, she's using her chair and her little stool as a closet and a hat stand. And over the cracked window pane, you see her cashmere shawl. The shawl in French novels is a commodity that signals social status in a way that uh, designer handbags do now. Um, it also can denote moral character. Shawls were only supposed to be worn at a certain point by married women because they were such expensive objects that an unmarried woman couldn't possibly procure one by decent means. Um, so despite the fact that this woman lives in pathetic circumstances, she has all of these expensive accessories. This is one of the rare imitations of the actual twill tapestry uh, technique that was used in Kashmir, but this shawl was made in Russia. This is between about 1810 to 1820, uh, probably made at a workshop um, run by a woman named Merlina in the, a region um, called Novgorod, uh, about what's now about five hours away from Moscow, but is still in central western Russia. Um, several Russian entrepreneurs did set up workshops. They tried to import the cashmere goat hair, and they used hand, the hand-woven twill tapestry technique. However, no one would mistake this shawl either for a cashmere product or um, for a Western European product. The design obviously based on the formula of the shawl uh, or the sash coming from Kashmir has the paisley shapes um, with what look like, well, European flowers, flowers that you would find in Western Europe and in Russia. But this right here, I swear, is some sort of root vegetable. <coughs> I think it, it, it's just very, you know, very Russian. And I think the designer, he or she, probably looked around at the local flora and fauna and said, how can we make the paisley our own? This, the competitive nature of trying to keep up with making paisley shawls, providing paisley shawls, really manifests itself um, very clearly in the story of a man called William Moorcroft, who was a British doctor who went out to Kashmir, went out to India with the East India Company in the early 19th century. He lived until, he was born in 1767 and lived until 1825. His story is really a case study of the attitudes of the British in the early 19th century when their relationship to the Indian subcontinent was transitioning from a trade partnership to more of a politically subordinate role um, as uh, India becomes part of the empire. So he was trained as a doctor. Um, he went to India in 1808, to be precise. Um, when he took trips to Kashmir, he became particularly entranced with the textile production there and being aware that the British were trying to make up, um, make their own production because the cashmere shawls coming from cashmere couldn't be made in, uh, couldn't be made quickly enough to supply European demand and they were extremely expensive and extremely time consuming to make. So he commissioned in 1823 a series of, we think about 30 drawings of cashmere shawl designs, signified just by the paisley or the bota motif. This is all you need, one of these, to go from there and design an entire shawl. So he had these designs done. We have eight of them in the Met. We think that they're the only ones that survive. Um, not only did he take designs from the, uh, the Indian artisans, but he also tried to export cashmere goats, and he suggested 
that entire families from Kashmir move to uh, Norwich or to Paisley. Um, fortunately, I think none of them took him up on that. Um, the export of the goats was planned in a very uh, poor but typically perhaps Victorian way. All of the male goats went on one ship and all of the female goats went on another ship. <coughs> So when the female goats all perished in a shipwreck, there was no more goat, goats to be raised in England. Um, and no one tried it again. It was, it was a far too, uh, far too costly endeavor. Moorcroft's research suggested that as many as 120,000 people were working in the Kashmir region in the shawl making industry. Um, gathering the wool, raising the goats, gathering the wool, dyeing the wool, um, drawing up designs, and making the products themselves. And that number may include merchants as well. Um, we're not entirely sure. Um, so these drawings were actually made for very specific markets. Um, to our eye, they may look quite similar in terms of coloring. But his notations say, um, from left to right, they have, um, they have lovely color names, um, which probably sound better in the original language, but I don't speak that. Um, pomegranate co color, which was for the, um, the Indian market, the Hindustan market, as he noted it. Um, elephant color in the center, a kind of dark gray, for the Persian market, and verdigris color for the Russian market. Um, his no he noted that shawls and cashmere fabrics were being exported from the region not only to India and to Europe, but also to Turkey, to Armenia, Persia, Afghanistan, Uzbek, and to um, Turkestan, which at that point was ruled by the Chinese for export to um, the Eastern Russian market. This is an image from a pattern book um, for printed textiles, which we know came from France, um, but which is mostly undated. It's a fascinating collection of patterns, um, but with a wide date range from about 1780 to 1830. Um, this first image is a typical Paisley design that might have been used uh, in any number of techniques. Uh, Printing was going on. Um, the border, you see the paisley and the border suggests that this was going to be a shawl shaped um, object. However, the paisley very quickly becomes, has the possibility to sort of mutate into something practically unrecognizable. Um, but I do suggest these starfish like designs um, are based on a paisley or inspired by a paisley motif, as you can see right here. And they have this sort of jagged edge that suggests the twill tapestry weaving effect. Here we have from a pattern book of uh, circa 1840 designs from Alsace, which was a region um, known for its printed textiles. These patterns in dark brown, dark sort of reddish brown are much more sedate use of the paisley motif. We have hundreds, if not thousands, of designs and small swatches of this type. So you see that this was just, they were just cranked out at an increasingly great rate throughout the 19th century. And we'll have some more examples from, uh, from the later 19th century. This is from, these are designs from a French book dated about 1844. Um, it was called The Guide for Industrial Design, um, published in Paris. And this is the point at which I thank my intern, uh, Chloe, whose fingers you can see in the picture, because the book's very tightly bound, so we couldn't, I couldn't hold it open on my own. Um, there are historicizing patterns in this, in this textile uh, pattern book. There are exotic patterns. There are conventional patterns. There are neoclassical patterns. Um, and then there are a number of patterns that clearly ref reflect this growing mania for the paisley. Now, these are said to be patterns taken from actual Indian shawls. And you see that they have this sort of, again, this sort of jagged edge in the design that indicates that these are true Indian twill tapestry woven um, shawls. 
Here are two French designs which were shown at the um, Industrial Exposition of 1844. Um, the two designs, this is one of the, the Industrial Expo Exposition of 1844 was one of the last national expositions of industry and agriculture before the event, um, the advent of the World's Fairs, starting with the London Crystal Palace Fair in 1851. The competition between manufacturers, as I've mentioned, was quite fierce. Um, Europeans, unlike the Russians, never tried to re reproduce the twill tapestry technique itself, but they did try very hard to reproduce the effects. Here we see another French design juxtaposed with a Scottish shawl from about the same moment. And at this point, Parisian shawl design and paisley design for what the Parisians call cashmere shawls really takes over the market. Um, Paris being at this point a leader in fashion and a leader in fashion design and Lyon being a leader in um, weaving technology. Um, this point really, uh, they really sort of take over the design. You can see that the paisley themselves are becoming these long attenuated figures and the Scottish shawl on the far side has taken on also some of these sort of snake-like designs that you see in the French drawing of about 1844. Uh, this is, these are some more details of the, uh, the Scottish shawl. And again, you see how the paisley motif has taken on all sorts of new qualities. On the far side, you see um, that the paisley has almost become like the serrated leaf that we see in a lot of Ottoman weaving. Across the channel, uh, this is a British journal of design. And like the 1844 French <coughs> publication, uh, this one is from 1849, we see a kind of record of what's being made in Great Britain. Um, the paisley is used in a variety of ways for dressing gowns. Um, these are all woven patterns but um, it's being used at large and small scale, um, being used for men's and women's fashion. Um, it doesn't quite have the um, panache, shall we say, of the French designs. Um, but this just shows you, the, again, a taste of the variety of the kinds of things that are being made using this motif. This is probably the best shawl in our collection. <laughs> Um, some of you may recognize it. Um, this is almost certainly a prize-winning shawl from the 1849 Agricultural and Industrial Exposition, um, the last one before the international exhibitions of, eight, of 1851. So this is the last French national exhibition. Um, this shawl with this combination of a weave structure. Um, it has a weave structure that is characteristic of India. It's an imitation of the twill tapestry technique. The maker, um, the company was called Denarose and Bois Glavie, and um, Monsieur Denarose claimed to have created a machine that imitated the technique of uh, twill tapestry weaving. And you can see it has the characteristic twill. He claimed to be able to do this mechanically. Um, he wrote a treatise on this. Now, this is um, apparently a debatable fact amongst people who have been studying shawls a lot longer than I have, that he may have published that treatise purely to promote his work, and that he actually wasn't technically capable of producing some, something like that. And this was more handwork than it was machine work. But we are entering the phase when the mechanical patterning by way of the jacquard loom is starting to make this kind of thing possible. Um, this is such an amazing combination of the attenuated paisley motif. Uh, the interior, the white part of the shawl has almost completely disappeared. All this wonderful vegetation growing up into the center. And I just show you this detail. And I have one more detail. There's a little insect there on the petal of the peony and uh, drops of water right there. That only appears in one place on the shawl. 
So this, whether it was hand woven or machine woven, required a huge amount of planning. The shawl is um, 12 feet long and six feet wide. Now, this is an exposition piece, but um, shawls were very large at this point to go over the, um, the fashions of the 19th century. They were long to begin with, nine to 10 feet long is a sort of, sort of average size. Uh, just to give you some context for mid 19th century fashions, so there is a very long shawl being worn over um, an American dress, a European shawl on the near side. Um, that's uh, there about 1855, um, the American ensemble. And then on the far side is a French printed cotton paisley printed dress. Um, so it's around this time that the Scottish town of Paisley really takes over the production in Great Britain and we can actually call this motif a paisley. I mean, it is the word that we use in English. Um, and, unless you know Indian art, you're not going to know the term bota. Uh, the French use the term pine or andien or uh, cone, but paisley, I think, is probably in the English language the most widely accepted word. This is another French shawl from about um, 1855, again. Um, there are a couple of French designers, a couple other French designers whose names we know. Um, Antony Berus is one of the most famous ones, um, and an Amédée Couder. Um, this design might be the work of either one of those. Um, we've pretty much lost the paisley here, though. And the shawl mania has taken us, again, into this conflated, exotic world where uh, this has taken us to a kind of East Asian, perhaps Chinese, maybe a little bit of Japanese sort of world. Um, but the challenge of weaving something 10 feet long and five feet wide uh, and making an exhibition piece was just, was a challenge that the French designers really took up with a great deal of enthusiasm. By the 1860s um, into the 1870s, uh, this is a French fashion plate from uh, a journal called Le Mode Illustré and a British shawl of the 1860s. Um, most people with disposable income for good quality fashion could afford a shawl. It was no longer um, a real luxury. They were being churned out uh, at a pretty high rate. There are many, many, many of them still on the market today. Uh, the best ones are mostly um, in, uh, in museum collections. But you see that it's starting to become a slightly less distinguished design. I think you can even see from a flat image on a flat screen that this design looks much flatter than some of the more, the bolder designs. And this is perhaps by overproduction, um, perhaps also by changes in fashion, um, the shawl really starts to fall out of favor um, starting in the 60s, 70s of the 19th century. Um, however, uh, we don't want to say that women had all the fun in terms of wearing paisleys and uh, participating in this exotic, um, kind of exotica. Um, the smoking jacket and the establishment of exotically decorated smoking rooms, both in private homes and in semi-public clubs, really brings the paisley motif and Indian and Persian male dress uh, into a somewhat mainstream Western society. Uh, not for public wear, but for, for private wear. Um, these, the rooms in particular, again, are a real mashup of exotic motifs, but we see a lot of India, we see a lot of paisley in the fabrics. Um, you can see from the textile detail that again, the twill structure is, is retained. It is copied as often as possible. These two images are from a really beautiful exhibition that was at uh, the Metropolitan Museum in 2013, um, Impressionism, Fashion, and Modernity. And the exhibition really did a wonderful job of showing the close relationship between uh, painters of the late 19th century 
fashion plates and fashion photography. I actually, I admit to being surprised at how close those relationships were. It was really very fascinating. Um, the, the painting is uh, Claude Monet. It's uh, Madame Louis Joachim uh, Godiver of 1868. Um, this particular painting was one that was compared very closely to fashion photography. It's more a picture of a fashionable, wo fashionable woman than it is of Madame Godiver. And we happen to have uh, items very close to what she's wearing. You can see with the increase in tailoring in women's fashion and the increase in uh, decoration that's aligned with the tailoring, that's emphasizing the lines, that something unstructured and voluminous like a shawl is starting to work perhaps less well with contemporary fashion. Um, and I think this is definitely a reason that it does fall out of favor. Um, the uh, painter Alfred Stevens, this is a painting titled After the Ball of 1874. Um, he's known, uh, as Tissot is known, for incredibly detailed paintings of society figures of women's fashion. And the fact that he includes um, a yellow shawl in this is um, it's such a feature of this moment where a, um, an upset young woman is being consoled by her friend. Perhaps she was spurned at the ball, you know, we don't know. These are narratives, they're not, they're not um, portraits of anyone in particular, but they are elegant women in Parisian interiors. Um, it's interesting that he showed uh, a yellow shawl. We don't know if his choice had anything to do with the feature of a yellow cashmere shawl, which is almost a character in um, Balzac's novel, La, uh, La Cousin Bette of 1846, where the yellow shawl is an object of envy and desire and is transferred from one woman to another. Um, it becomes a symbol of morality, of the transition from one regime to another in France and of the fall of the old regime. And the fact that Balzac used a shawl as one of the symbols, certainly not the only, but one of the symbols of the transfer of power between women and the, um, the fall of a regime is really pretty extraordinary. Then we move on to um, another story of uh, the British in India, um, a British advocate for Indian textiles, um, a man named John Forbes Watson, who was another doctor who went to India with the British East India Company. Um, he collected textile samples during his time there. These uh, samples were collected between about 1860 and 1880. At the Met, we have a series of 17 volumes that were collected um, and put together textiles from all over India. And there are over 900 individual sample, samples that are categorized by different types. So you have the men's garment here, a kind of a sash or shawl, and on the far side you have yardage of a silk and metal thread woven, very precious textile that would have been used for fashion. Uh, and then you have uh, simple printed and painted cottons that were produced in various regions of, um, of mostly northern India. He put these books together and he called them industrial museums or trade museums. His idea was to distribute this set of volumes, uh, 17 in total, and he made, I think, 30 different sets to both British manufacturers and to Indian manufacturers so that the British manufacturers could understand the market in India for what they could provide best and the Indian producers could understand what they could provide best for the rest of the world. This is a moment of decline for Indian textile manufacture and the cashmere shawls fall into that, but the paisley appears in lots of other, uh, in lots of other motifs and lots of other types of textiles. We have, as I said, probably thousands of examples of paisleys in the museum's collections. These are mid 19th century paisley printed cottons from a collection that came from a German professor, 
probably produced in Germany. Um, very simple motifs, the blue and white motifs, and then a more elaborate one in the center. Um, you can see, again, this idea of showing that kind of jagged line, still a reminder, a kind of echo of the traditional twill tapestry uh, technique. These are Russian paisleys made in the 1890s. This is a prize-winning manufacturer that was uh, working outside of Moscow. These are made for local consumption, but they're also made for export, particularly into, um, uh, into the Asian uh, Caucasus areas. And we have, there are a lot of those. Peter, you know there are a lot of these, don't you? <laughs> At this point, we get into the period of reuse of the classic Paisley shawl. Uh, this is an uh, about 1891 uh, at-home gown, what's known as a tea gown. Uh, this is an American-made garment, probably from a French shawl from the mid-19th century. The recycling of the shawl as a fashion fabric happens pretty quickly. I mean, this does follow on the tradition of valuing expensive textiles in the making of uh, fashions really from the Middle Ages, where clothes are cut and recut and passed down. However, this seems to be a particularly violent transmutation of the shawl into something completely different. In the 1920s, there is, again, a kind of resurgence of exoticism. Um, I would suggest that these three American ensembles are slightly more sensitive for use of uh, the shawl, uh, particularly the dress on the far side, where all elements of the shawl are sort of given room to breathe, and you see the growing of the paisley motif into what was the field, and the field frames the face of the wearer. So uh, if a paisley shawl has to be cut up, I would say that's maybe not the worst thing that could happen to it. But this is, this is still happening. Um, I didn't pull out any sort of 1960s examples, but it does, it certainly happens in the 60s and, and in the 1970s. Many shawls were preserved through collectors, through textile collectors, and two of the best and most interesting shawls in our collection were owned by one person. They were owned by a Polish-born opera singer called Gana Walska. Uh, she lived until 1984. She sold a lot, of her, uh, a lot of her goods in the 1960s, and that's when we happened to purchase these pieces. Um, she was an opera singer who worked in the US and in Europe. She was of limited talent, apparently, but was supported by a series of six husbands who <laughs> bought her lessons and bought her time on the stage. And she bought shawls. She was an incredible jewelry collector. And she bought houses. Uh, so she, she did quite well. But it's very interesting that she recognized um, that these were some of the best of a genre. So, and this is why we have some of these beautiful things. There has been a kind of recent resurgence in the Paisley motif, both in its popularity in the West and its production in Kashmir and in northern India. Um, these photos are courtesy of the Kashmir Loon Company. I had the pleasure of meeting uh, some people who are working in Kashmir last year. Um, these are embroidered shawls. And this is not something that I talked about much, but embroidered shawls certainly existed both made in Kashmir and made in Western Europe. So the techniques um, do follow on. It is the twill tapestry technique that was a sort of classic, but the embroidered shawl appeared very quickly. Um, these are high-end luxury goods. The shawl on the far side with the embroidery all over, I, was, I asked him for statistics. Um, he said it took about three years for an individual to embroider that shawl. Um, it is a hundred and nine feet long. 
Um, the one on the near side with uh, just the border and the scalloped edges took about 18 months for an individual to complete, and that's about seven and a half feet long. So, you know, I'm very pleased to see that there is this luxury market that is being revived um, in the area of Kashmir. It's obviously a disputed area of the world, um, but it is being revived both uh, as a traditional motif in the culture from which it came, and it still does retain that exotic appeal um, in the West. And um, I have to say, if I could afford one, that um, this is what my apartment would, uh, would look like if I could buy one of these shawls. Um, I clearly have a great affection for these objects and for this motif. It's been very interesting to really start an exploration of this. Um, I'm not sure that I've, even in the period of time that I've covered, that I've really gotten to the heart of it, but it's, it's a very compelling story. There are issues of gender, there are issues of, again, the anonymous maker that I've just touched on, and I think we need to understand a lot more about these objects, about their disbursement, about the economics behind their making all over the world before we can really tackle those issues. But there, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, and um, I hope to be able to do more of it. So thank you for listening to this. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, yeah. Melinda will take so, a few questions if you have any. I'll give you the Yes, this is a copy of the 1849 <laughs> shawl, <laughs> in case you're wondering. For sale. I don't know if we still have them. Yes, it was reproduced by the museum, actually, in honor of a woman who um, used to work in our uh, textile reproduction department. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I just want to point out something. Uh, Melinda, you had, uh, uh, you had talked about the, the number of uh, people in production in Kashmir. And in my research, uh, of course, it wasn't only um, the uh, the emergence of manufacturing in Europe, but uh, also because of a series of, of political and natural disasters. But I think by the end of the 19th century, the early 20th century, it was something like seven looms that we, uh, or se seven companies mm. in Kashmir that were still producing shawls. And I think that kind of drop off in numbers is really remarkable and is also one of the most poignant aspects of this history, that in such a short number of years, uh, the West was in effect able to completely uh, destroy uh, their, their yeah. manufacturing of these yeah. items. With the, the political situation, competition from the faster weaving in the West, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know the, the sort of conventional wisdom is that it was European fashion that drove the downfall, but obviously there, the Kashmiri weavers were exporting to a lot of different markets. Um, so, but however, the British are in large part responsible for, or partially responsible, I should say, for um, some of the political situation there and the control of the market and the control of exports um, by the late 19th century. So, um, yeah, it, you know, I think it was a kind of uh, perfect storm of um, a bad situation for the Kashmiri weavers at that point. And, and I have a question for you in terms of uh, the popularity of the Paisley motif these last few years. Uh, yeah. What do you account it uh, to? We're seeing so much pattern in fashion, we're seeing lace, we're seeing paisleys, we're seeing big, bold, I, you know, I think everybody got a little bit tired of the monochrome black, I don't know, what, how do you explain changes in fashion, but, but I, th I do, yeah, I do think that there, it is part of a moment of um, exuberance in patterning and texturing and I would like to say it's an appreciation for um, quality in textiles. I think there is some of that. 
Um, that's what pleases me so much about these hand embroidered shawls, and they are doing some hand weaving as well in the, in the traditional techniques, um, that there is still a luxury market for that. I don't, I can't afford them, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's back there. Um, but um, I, I, I do, there is an appreciation for pattern. And I would, I think, just in a larger sense, I don't know that we can say it's Paisley specifically. I don't know. Um, but regarding Paisley specifically, and I think this is an honor, I'm not doing it. Oh. Um, is it, I mean, the least expensive scarf you can get, the bandana, which we can buy for a dollar right. a piece on Canal Street. Um, all, there are so many motifs that are coming out of that form that we like because they feel regenerative, I think. Yes, yeah. It, it, and the, you know, the, the bandana with the paisley or other decoration on it sort of crosses um, the line or, or you know, sort of a melding of traditions of the paisley motif at this very high-end hand-woven court um, production and printed cotton production that uh, the Indian, we know that Indian cotton producers were exporting stamped, printed, resist dyed cottons from the early centuries of this millennia. So that those two things sort of meld in that. Um, and the, yeah, the printed cotton bandana, it, it is, I mean, I. I, but I, I wonder, you know, I wonder if people think more about that uh, as being associated with, you know, Levi's and the West. I, I think in that case, the association with India um, may be completely, completely lost. Um, it's hard to know what an individual uses as an association. Um, I was wondering if you have seen like the spirit of manufacturing from Kashmir go to a different city? Or I'm sorry. I has the like spirit of manufacturing from Kashmir moved to a different city at all? Or is it more larger manufacturing happening in other places like you mentioned in China? Um, it's, you know, it's stayed in that, in that region. Um, you know, I honestly don't know. Uh, the Kashmir Loom Company is based in Delhi. But they're sourcing, um, they are sourcing their materials from Kashmir. And it's, it appears that a lot of the work is being done in Kashmir. There was um, a yeah, in Kashmir. Yeah. So, um, but, but textile production, there is a real revival of uh, hand and luxury textile production happening in, in India in general. And I can only imagine that. Um, some of the larger centers like Delhi are also trying to take advantage of that. But yes, there is, um, there is production happening in, in Kashmir, as Peter confirms as well. Hi, I, I thought the, the origin of Paisley being from uh, botany was very fascinating. And I wonder if there's another movement that started with botany and became as strong as Paisley did? Well, I think that, you know, in a larger sense, we could just, we could say Paisley is, is just part of the perennial popularity of floral and um, foliate motifs. Um, we could follow, say, the acanthus leaf um, from ancient Greece and Rome. Um, we can follow a lot of other sort of identifiable, stylized um, botanical motifs. The tree of life um, is, I think, as equally mysterious as the paisley um, in terms of its actual origins. It doesn't come out of a particular plant, though. No, no. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, singer Prince, who made Paisley so much more popular yep. within the past 30 years because it was his favorite of all patterns. You know, I didn't, um, I didn't, you know, I was going to bring him into it. I wasn't going that far in my talk, but I did think I should mention Paisley Park. I should mention Francis. But yes, um, you know, and he's such a great example of um, that uh, gender, di what gender differentiation for him, what there was, you know, there was less gender differentiation for him in his, in his life and his dressing. Um, and I think he's a, he's a great example of how fluid the Paisley motif is and can be and how it still has this kind of exotic a appeal for Americans because he was really, you know, the only one um, wearing that at that, you know, at that point. It's sort of, it had sort of gone out of fashion. But no, I can't say that this was timed to um, have anything to do with his, the anniversary of his death. Okay. Sorry. It would have been a good idea to focus it that way. Um, are you familiar with the collection of Krishna Ribu at the Musée Guimet? Yes. Oh, yes. What fabulous. a beautiful museum. And, and the V&A. Yes. And Chateau Cambrésis. Yeah. I don't you know, know that collection. That's no. where Matisse was born. And you know, it's a textile city. So in all of his paintings, you see many of these paisleys mm. that are draped over tables, you know, hanging over windows. Right, right. Yeah, I wanted to do this as kind of an exercise of what I could do um, within the Met. Um, this came out of conversations with Peter. He was coming to the museum and bringing his classes to the museum. And uh, it's, you know, it's, we can do a lot, but yes, to do a full and thorough um, study of this, we'd certainly leave, I, I would need to leave the Met. Yeah. <laughs> a good idea to get out and about every once in a while. Can I ask but one yes. more question? Uh, do you see any uh, international Paisley exhibit in the future? The v &A had yeah. one, I think, about 10 years ago, yeah. and the Musée yeah. Galleria did one six years ago, I think. Yeah. And but I'm did. always looking for the next one. I know, one. I know. Um, possibly. I, I shouldn't speak for a colleague I know who's working on this material, but yeah, um, po possibly closer to home than um, Europe. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, in terms of your question. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Paisley Museum um, uh, is one of the few museums in the UK that has gotten funding to expand. Uh, they're closed right now, but uh, they're going to be reopening in, in a new building and showing much more of their collection. And uh, they also played a role in sending a Paisley sample uh, in a satellite to outer space. And uh, this is all part of, of course, the bid for the city, the town of, of Paisley, to, uh, to be the center of European culture, I think, in 2020 or something like that, or 2021. Um, and there was a really spectacular show that I did not know about mm. at the uh, Antonio Ratti Center in Italy uh, last year on, uh, on the Paisley. So it's, again, as, as Melinda said, it's one of those things that uh, once you scratch the surface, it's just, especially right now, it's really everywhere, really everywhere. And I have my theories about that. We'll reveal those in the fall. Please. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a really great yeah. note to end on. Thank you, Melinda Watt. Really wonderful. Thank you.